So when we think about our arrhythmia zones, so our VT zones, then we can have different levels of therapy in each of them. So zone one might simply be a monitoring zone. So where we'll look at a rhythm and record it, but we might not want the device to necessarily treat it. If we look at our second zone, then we might try some anti-tachycardia pacing and then some defibrillation. And then in our really fast zone, so in our VF zone, we might just have defibrillation. And there's good reason for this. And that is defibrillation is extremely successful at treating ventricular arrhythmias. So really, the faster and the nastier that rhythms get, is the more we lean towards using defibrillation as our first line of therapy. So how does defibrillation work? Well, a high energy shock is delivered to the heart. The way the device does this is utilizing either one or two coils on the ICD lead and the device itself. What this does is capture a critical mass of tissue, depolarizing it all at once and allowing sinus rhythm to regain control of the heart. Now it is vastly more successful in treating these ventricular arrhythmias than ATP, but it does have some downsides. But first let's look at a real life example of where ATP was unsuccessful and so the device eventually resorted to a high energy shock to treat the rhythm. Now here we can see detection is met, two episodes of burst ATP are delivered, both unsuccessful, Two episodes of ramp ATP are delivered, again unsuccessful, and eventually the device decides to deliver a high voltage charge which successfully terminates the arrhythmia. And of course, this protocol, this therapy protocol is a programmable protocol and would have been put in place by somebody who is programming the device to work as they want it. Here they've gone for four episodes of ATP before resorting to a high voltage shock. So how are we able to generate such a high voltage shock from a battery which is often as little as 3.1 volts? Well, it's all down to the capacitor. What the capacitor does is store energy and the battery is able to pour loads of its energy into the capacitor and fill it up until it's full with a high voltage charge ready to go. At that point, the capacitor delivers all that energy in one go via the ICD lead. Now the capacitor does take time to charge, and we have to factor that into our decision making process. If you think about the arrhythmia, we have a detection time delay where the arrhythmia has to be sustained long enough for the device to consider therapy. If detection is met and the device decides to charge for a shock, we have further time before therapy is eventually delivered. Now, it's not something that we get overly concerned about, but it's just something to be mindful of, that we detect the arrhythmia, and then actually there's going to be a delay until the high voltage shock is delivered, whilst the capacitor charges. Another consideration is battery depletion. Now, obviously, if we think about the battery pouring loads of its energy into the capacitor for every shock, this can really deplete the energy. In actual fact, estimates suggest that for every shock delivered by the device, this can reduce the battery longevity by one month. And if you think that some people can have up to 12 or even more shocks during an event, this can have huge implications on how long the device is going to last. So I hope you liked this video. It was taken from our CME accredited ICD Essentials course. Absolutely make sure to check it out and to register for a free trial account which will give you access to selected lessons in the course. If you want to learn how Met Mastery can help you become a great clinician, make sure to watch the About Met Mastery video. So take care and I hope to talk to you soon.